Good morning, church. We do take an opportunity this morning uh, just to set aside in remembrance of all those that have laid down their lives for, for our country and service uh, throughout the history of this nation. Uh, we pray for those that have lost loved ones and service to our country. We pray for their peace and comfort uh, in this this weekend of remembrance. And so if you would go with me to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that, that one day, Lord, there will be no more wars. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that one day there will be no more strife. There will be no more hatred. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that there will be no more no violence, there'll be no need for cemeteries or graveyards, no need for hospitals, no need for prisons, because you will make all things right in your kingdom to come. And Heavenly Father, Lord, we rejoice in that reality. But as we live in this broken world, Lord, we ask that you would bring you peace and comfort to the hearts of those that have lost loved ones. This weekend, we pause and reflect upon those that have lost loved ones in service to this country. That Heavenly Father, you would, you would give them an extra special anointing of your grace, Lord. And that gracious Heavenly Father, you would remind us, Lord, of the ultimate sacrifice that was made by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That gave access to freedom for all individuals. Lord, we praise you for that, and we thank you for that. As we get ready to open your word, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds. You would open our hands, whatever we're trying to hold on to, Lord, whatever we're clinging to that is not of you, God, that we would let that go. And that gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, our hearts would be aligned with the will that you have for us as revealed in your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would transform our hearts and our lives, renew our minds, give us Christ-like vision to see individuals not as they are now, but as they could be in Christ Jesus. And give us vision to see circumstances and situations not as they are now, but what they will give way to one day as we enter into glory. Lord, we praise you and we give you all honor and praise for you're the only one worthy of it. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to start a new series that will take us to out uh, the length of the summer. Uh, we will spend 12 weeks in the book of Psalms looking at various Psalms. I've asked a few individuals to come throughout the duration of the summer uh, to preach to us, to, to come and open up God's word to us. And in two weeks from today, uh, Nick Garland will come, Pastor Nick Garland will come, and he will, he will preach to us out of the book of Psalms. And I've asked four others over the duration of those 12 weeks to come and to preach, but Brother Nick will be here in a couple weeks uh, to preach uh, from Psalm number one, looking forward to that. And so I've asked these individuals to come to, to preach out of their favorite psalm or to preach from a psalm that is, has really comforted them or brought them peace in, in certain times of their life or that they turn to and find comfort from. Today, I'm going to preach to you from, from my favorite psalm, a psalm that has brought me comfort, has brought me peace in various times of troubles and tribulations a psalm that I go to time and time again, and ultimately the psalms do that for us. Maybe I'm not alone in that, that when I find myself in a desolate place spiritually, oftentimes it's the psalms that I turn to and they minister to me and they, they, they impress upon my heart praise and they impress upon my heart the truth and the reality of who God is and that we can be open and honest and transparent as Pastor Dakota talked about last week. And although we say this is the opening uh, uh, day of our new sermon series, that we launched that out, really, I, begin, I believe it began last week. Pastor Dakota did such a great job of laying a groundwork of the reality that we do have suffering in our lives and trials and tribulations we do encounter. And when they squeeze in on us and they press in on us, that what ought to result is trust and praise. And we see that all throughout the Psalms, that the various psalmists, as they encounter troubles and suffering and trials, that as they are pressed in upon, what comes out of them is trust and praise. And I believe that's why the Psalms have provided so much comfort and solace to so many for so long. 
And so today we're going to be in the 34th Psalm, a Psalm that has encouraged me and strengthened me on many occasions. And I pray that it will do the same for you as well. So if you would go ahead and open your Bibles to the 34th Psalm. Now, the individual Psalms of, uh, of the book uh, come from several different authors, but out of the 150 Psalms that are in our Bible, uh, we see that David wrote over half of those. But there were other individuals that wrote various Psalms as well. Asaph wrote 12 Psalms. The sons of Korah wrote 10 Psalms. Solomon wrote two Psalms. Moses wrote a Psalm. Maybe you did not realize that, but Moses wrote the 90th Psalm. Haman, uh, spelled He-Man, but it's pronounced Haman. But anyways, uh, He-Man wrote uh, the 88th Psalm. You didn't know that. By the power of great, no, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the, the 88th Psalm. And then Ethan, good old Ethan, wrote Psalm 89. So we see that there are various individuals that wrote these Psalms that were experienced various trials and tribulations as well. Now, these Psalms were recorded over about a thousand-year period starting around the time of Moses and ending in the post-exilic period. And in that, we see that most of the Psalms, although written by David, or, or written by David, were written in David and Solomon's time, and that the final editor, the one that composed the Psalms into the collection that we have, was more than likely, scholars believe, Ezra. And so that brings us to the 34th Psalm. And so if you would, follow along with me as I read to you from God's Word, and then we will unpack this together. And I pray that it will bring you much encouragement as a result. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 5. Those who, took, those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Verse 11, come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The voice of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And may God bless the reading of his word. There are four components of this psalm that David has written. The, these four components really move from, from David exalting God to David testifying about the reason why he's exalting God because of the experience he's had with God at work in his life. Then he's going to move and exhort us to place our our trust in God Almighty alone. And then he's going to conclude by explaining the character of God and why it is we should place our trust in God and God alone. So let's start with 
verses 1 through 3, and we look at David's exaltation. Look at verse 3. It says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. That's basically what we've just been doing in one form and one fashion. What you're doing now is another form and fashion of praising God, studying his word, joining together in corporate worship, joining with other brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, coming to study God's word. That is a that is a form of praise. That is a form of worship. Singing songs of praise to God Almighty is a form of, of worship. And what David is saying is that, that God is deserving of exaltation, that we ought to exalt him. We ought to lift him up above all things, above all people, that regardless of what it is that we are facing, regardless of what it is that we may be dealing with in this place right now in our lives, that God is worthy to be exalted. He is worthy of us to lift high. Now, David's exaltation, as we see in verses 1 through 3, is individual, it's infinite, it's infectious, and it's inviting. First off, it's individual. Look at verse 1. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. He's determined in his heart that regardless of what it is that is going on in his life, he will praise God Almighty. That is a conscious decision that he has made for himself. I will praise the Lord, and his praise will continually be in my mouth. I'm not waiting on my mama to praise him. I'm not waiting on my dad to praise him. I'm not waiting on somebody else to praise him. I'm not waiting on the worship pastor to praise him. I'm not waiting on the individual to my left or my right to praise him. I, I, I don't know anything what anybody else is going to do, but I can tell you what, I'm going to praise God. It's this idea of Joshua as he lays before God's people that you choose for yourself this day who it is you're going to serve. But for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. So you need to determine in your heart, who are you going to praise? And the more you spend time with God Almighty, the more when the world starts to press in on you, the more praise and trust come out of you. And so it's an individual exaltation. It's something that he is doing. But it's also infinite. L listen to this. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. A a a at all times. Not just the good times. Not just the times when, when things are going my way. But I'm going to praise God at all times. Because he is worthy of all praise. Because God doesn't change with our circumstances and our situations. God is worthy of our praise at our lowest moment and at our highest. For he is above all of that. And so we need to understand that, that what David is saying is that he is going to exalt God Almighty at all times, and he's going to do it continuously. And for each and every believer that is in this room, I pray that our hearts would be determined that we are going to praise God no matter what. Don't let the devil steal your praise because of a circumstance or a situation that you may be going through or have gone through or may be facing. The, the whole goal of Satan was to usurp the role of God Almighty and to receive praise. Ultimately, he wants what is rightfully due God Almighty. And what is rightfully due God Almighty by all of his, all of his creation is exaltation and praise. And when we allow the enemy to come into our life and use a circumstance or a situation to close our mouth and to keep us from praising God, then we have fallen victim to one of the greatest schemes of the enemy that there is. And David says that I'm going to praise God continually and that his praise will always be in my mouth. But it's also infectious. You see, because when we do that, when we praise God in our good times, when we, when we don't take credit for those things, when we praise God in the bad times and we're not crushed as a result, then other individuals see in our lives something that they are missing in theirs. They see in us something that they are not experiencing. And we see this reality in verse 2. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Those that are humbled in heart, when they hear the praise or the exaltation of David, that it in turn causes them to be glad. It causes them to be joyous. It causes them to be blessed. We see this idea that our praise accomplishes that as well. Acts 16, 25 to 26 is a great example of this. 
In Acts 16, 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. So in the, in the middle of their chains, in the middle of this prison, they start just praising God. They just start singing praises to God. And verse 26 tells us, so that the foundations of the prison were shaking. God infuses their praise in such a way that it takes on a supernatural form and an earthquake happens. Now look at this. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Not just the ones that were singing. It wasn't just Paul and Silas. It wasn't just their bonds that were falling off. It wasn't just their prison doors that were opening up. But their praise was so infectious that all of the prison doors opened and all of the bonds fell off of everybody that was in that prison. Now, that's not to say that our praise can bring somebody to salvation in and of itself. But it sure does point out that there is something going on in that individual's life that's not going on in my life. And that's exactly what the Philippian jailer experiences when he comes running in and he sees all the doors are flung open. He's heard them singing and he wants to know what in the world is going on. And then he comes to a point of saying, what must I do to be saved? And it all started with the praise of God's people. In a moment that the enemy would have said, be silent. Look at where your faith has got you. Your faith has got you nowhere but a prison and in chains. And yet they said, my God is above any prison that you can put me in or any chains you can wrap around me. And I'm going to be faithful to praise him. And through their exaltation, uh, individual had his eternity changed through faith in Christ Jesus. It's infectious. Our lives ought to be infectious. Our praise ought to be infectious. But it's also inviting. And that's what we see with the Philippian jailer coming in. They were invited in to join into the song of the redeemed. Verse 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There's power in corporate worship. There's power in our time of coming together and singing praises to God, not just as individuals, but as a collective body of believers. That our praise invites other individuals in to experience the goodness of God Almighty. We also see that uh, this psalm lays out for us in the next section that David is going to share his testimony. That David is going to share his experience in verses 4 through 7. And so David is going to testify to the reality of the reason why I exalt God no matter what it is I'm facing or what it is that I'm going through and because of what it is I have experienced with God at work in my life. And so verses 4 through 7, we see that David's experience was God had delivered him, had delighted him, and had defended him. Look at verse 4. It says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. Verse 6 says, the poor man cried and the Lord heard him. This was his experience. He's testifying of the reality that he sought the Lord and the Lord answered him, that he cried out to the Lord and the Lord heard him. That was his experience. And as a result, he was delivered. It says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 6 goes on to say, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. What a beautiful reality and a beautiful truth. Has anybody been delivered in this place? I know God has delivered me. That, that, that picture of being delivered in the original language is an idea of something being snatched or taken out of. That what God has done to all those that have cried out to him is snatched them out of darkness, has snatched them out of the pit of despair, has snatched them out of their sin, has snatched them out of their pain and their misery, and has brought them into his marvelous life. He's delivered us. He snatched me out of my addiction. He snatched me out of my pain and suffering. He snatched me out of my sin, and he brought me into his marvelous life. And David says, because I've experienced that, because that is my testimony, I'm going to praise him. Because we have to come to a point where we have to determine in our minds, was the cross of Calvary enough? If God doesn't do another thing for us other than send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, and to cleanse us of our sins and to make us a new creation in Christ Jesus, we have to come to a point where we determine in our lives, is that enough? 
Now, in the church, we would definitely say that's enough for salvation, that we wouldn't say you, you don't add any work to the finished work of Jesus Christ. But is it enough to bring us satisfaction and comfort in this life? Oftentimes, the way we live is to answer that question in the negative. Now, for salvation, absolutely. But is it sufficient? For me, each and every moment of each and every day, well, I kind of need the cross and a bigger bank account. I, I kind of need the cross and I need better health. I, I kind of need the, the, the cross and I, 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 need, I need things to, to go better in my life or in my marriage. I, I need the cross and then this for me to be satisfied. And the question that we must determine in our hearts is, the cross of Jesus Christ isn't enough. Is his grace truly sufficient? He delivered us. But he also delighted us. You see, when, when his grace is sufficient, there's joy regardless of the situation or the circumstance that you find yourself in. There's peace and there's comfort that comes as a result of us resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Look, look at verse 5. It says, those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Those that look to him are radiant. See, David is saying, I am delighted. When I look upon the things of God, there's a delight that happens in my life. There's a joy that happens in my life. That word radiant in the original Hebrew is this, is this idea of, uh, have you ever seen a, a lake on a sunny day and it's got what looks like diamonds that are sparkling off of the lake as the sun hits upon that water and you see those, those little diamonds that look like they're on the top of the lake? That's the picture of radiant. It's this idea of, uh, of the sun hitting off of the water and sparkling off of the water. That when we look at God Almighty and we become conduits of reflecting his grace and his love and his mercy and his righteousness and his justice and his truth, then we project the light of Christ back out into the darkness of this world. And individuals look at us and they see the radiance, they see the joy in our life. Philippians 4.4, Paul would write to the church of Philippi and he would say this, in Philippians 4, 4, he would say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He didn't say rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Rejoice in the Lord when everything is going your way. He didn't say rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. He said rejoice in the Lord always. Because no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what is changing, no matter what news that you just received, no matter what it is that you're going through, God doesn't change. He is constant. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. There is no shifting shadow in God Almighty. And so, therefore, we can rejoice in the Lord. It doesn't say rejoice in your circumstances. It doesn't say rejoice in your situations. Th those things don't bring us joy. Sometimes we go through crushing things. It says take your eyes off of that. Rejoice in the Lord. Go back to the text. It says those who look to him are radiant. We're not just going to be radiant in and of ourselves. We're not going to be radiant if we're looking at the things of the world. But those that look to him are radiant, and their face will never be ashamed. That's why God's word tells us in Romans 8, 6, Paul would write these realities and these truths. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. What are you focusing in on? Where is your face turned? In trials and tribulations, what are you looking to? You look into the problem, you look into the, 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 the suffering, you look into the ways of the world. Well, guess what? You look back into the things of the flesh. All you're going to do is project death back out. All you're going to do is experience death. But if you look to God Almighty and your mind is focused in on the things of the Holy Spirit, the things of Christ Jesus and his redeeming work on the cross, the love of our Heavenly Father, then you can reflect joy and satisfaction back out into the world. And so he delighted him, but he also defended him. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamped around those who fear him and delivers them. That God encamps around his people. That God is our defender. That God is our protector. That God one day will make all things right. We can trust in him. And ultimately, that's exactly what it is that we're going to see David move to next in the psalm. 
In Proverbs 18.10, we, we see this reality of God defending us. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. In your moments of pain, in your moments of trial, in your moments of affliction, where do you run? For the longest time in my life, I ran to drugs. When I encountered pain and I encountered suffering, when I encountered uh, 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 distress, when I encountered things that, that, that hurt me or wounded me, I just turned to drugs. Drugs and, and anger, sex, all of the various things that the world offers to us and says, this will fulfill you, this will satisfy you, this is the answer for what it is that you're dealing with. But Jesus would teach that when you do that, all you're doing is building your life on sinking sand. And when the storms come, and they will come, the house that you've created for yourself will fall in like a house of cards. But there is a foundation that is solid as a rock. It's a strong tower. And those that run to it, they will be safe. They will have peace. And they can have joy. Because nothing can move the house that is built upon that rock, the rock of ages, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so he's now shared his testimony and his experience of what God has done in his life and why he exalts. And so now he is going to exhort. He's going to exhort us to taste and see that the Lord is good, to trust in the Lord, and to turn to the Lord. And so in verses 8 through 14, we see David, David's exhortation. And the first thing he says in verse 8, he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, come and experience what it is that I just told you because it's not that I'm special in any kind of way, but it's that my God is special in every kind of way. So if you will come to him, you will have the same experience that I had because he doesn't turn away anybody that comes to him in faith. So he exhorts them, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, if you've got young children... You know, like I know, that the greatest battle in your house is going to take place around the breakfast table, the lunch table, or the dinner table. Because your wife is going to spend that evening or that morning preparing a beautiful meal that you will enjoy. And your children just said they want all three of the things that your wife just made, only to sit down and say, now, I don't want any of this. I'm not going to eat any of this, and I want something else. Can I get an amen? Anybody, anybody else know what I'm talking about? Is it just me? Is it just me? I, I tell you what, if, if it's not a chicken strip, if it ain't a hot dog, if it ain't a hamburger or spaghetti, my kids probably ain't eating it. I can't get them to eat anything. I can't get them to eat, eat a thing. And there are things that they won't try that I know if you try it, you're going to like it. Same thing for the lost and the dying world that says, I don't want anything. I don't want anything to do with God. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Stop feasting upon the filth and the junk of this world and come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Naps is another thing. I need, to go back, I need to go back to when I was younger and just apologize to my mama and daddy and apologize to naps. Naps was a four-letter word to me back when I was a kid. Nap, I mean to tell you, I, I might as well, you might as well told me that I was going to go to the coal mine for the next week and not have anything to eat, and that's where you were sending me. Now, let somebody tell me to take a nap. Y'all tell me right now. I'll go into that room. <laughs> I'm not playing. Let me take it. Let me get a nap. Especially a Sunday afternoon nap. They just hit different, don't they? Them Sunday afternoon naps. I don't know what it is. God, God just said rest. And when you actually take him up on it, boy, I tell you, man, there's something about that nap. But my, my kid, you tell him, take, go take a nap. Oh, just a meltdown. Just, oh, he's just crying his little, little eyes out. Oh, I want to take a nap. But man, I wish somebody would tell me go take a nap. And that's what David is saying. He's saying, listen, you're fighting against the very thing you need. You're fighting against the very thing that if you will do it, you will see the benefit of it and you will experience the goodness of it. Come and taste of the Lord. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Matthew 5, 6, Jesus speaks 
in these terms as well. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. There's satisfaction when we come to Christ Jesus that we don't get anywhere else. But he also says to trust in the Lord. Now, he'll use the language of fear the Lord, uh, seeking the Lord, taking refuge in the Lord. But ultimately, it's this picture of trusting in the Lord. We see that in verse 8. The blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Verse 11 says, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. In other words, I'll teach you how to trust in the Lord. You need to trust in God Almighty. I know things may look bleak in this moment right now. I know things may be uh, uh, adding up and seem insurmountable, but you need to trust in God Almighty that he will deliver you in his perfect time and in his perfect way. So we see this reality that he exhorts them to trust in the Lord. Psalm 20, verse 7 through 8, David would write this. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. What are you trusting in? If you're being honest with yourself in this moment right now, what are you trusting in? Now, I know what the Sunday school answer is. I know we're in church, and I know everybody ought to say Jesus. The preacher ought to say Jesus. And there are many times in my life where I can honestly answer that I'm trusting in Jesus. But there's also times in my life that if I'm being open and honest, and if we're all being open and honest, I'm trusting in myself, or I'm trusting in something else, or I'm trusting in someone else to deliver me out of what it is that I'm dealing with in this moment. And if we're open and honest and truly being real with each other, we all experience that sometimes, even as believers, that our trust actually isn't in God. It's in some result that we hope that we can obtain through our own measure of uh, wisdom and strength. Don't trust in the chariots or the horses, the power that you can create, but trust in the name of the Lord. For all those that trust in everything else, they'll collapse and, and they, they, they will uh, fall. But we rise and stand upright. Now, notice that. To rise means you got to fall too. God's word doesn't ever try to paint the picture that we're not going to have times where we fall and stumble. But it does show that as believers of Jesus Christ, we're to rise and we're to stand upright. And if we trust in the name of the Lord, he will pick us up, he will dust us off, and he will set us back on the course that he has called us to. Third, we see that he exhorts them to turn to the Lord. Look at verse 14. He says, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. In other words, stop going the direction that you're going. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Trust in him and the direction that he's calling you to. Do an about face. Stop chasing after the things that this world is offering you. Do an about face and start turning towards the things of God. Turn away from evil and seek peace and pursue it. Now, notice you got to seek it. You got to pursue it. Turn to God and follow after the things that God has called you to each and every moment of each and every day as followers. And now he's going to conclude his psalm. With the fourth section, verses 15 through 22, which is David's explanation of why we should trust in the Lord, why we should turn to the Lord, and what we will experience if we taste of the Lord, we will see that he is good. And so verses 15 through 22, we see David explaining why it is that he's exhorting them to do these three things. And David will explain to them that God responds, that God rescues and that God redeems. Look throughout verses 15 through 22, and you see that God is an active God. Look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry. Verse 16, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. Back down, or all the way down in verse 21, it says, affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. God is a God who responds to what happens here on this earth, both in the lives of those that have placed their faith in him and those that have rejected him. Now, oftentimes, we feel like God is absent. 
We feel like God isn't responding in our moments of pain. Maybe you've been crying out to the Lord over a certain aspect of your life or a certain situation. You've been praying for God and you've been for him to move and it doesn't seem like God is moving. And you would say, I don't think God is a God who responds because I sure don't see him responding in this situation or in this situation. I don't see him responding to meet my need in this area. I don't see him responding to ease the pain of my life or suffering in this area. And so maybe you would reject the idea that God is a God who responds. But in doing so, you miss the reality of what your greatest need is, what your greatest suffering was, what your greatest trial was. You see, your greatest need was to be reconciled back to a perfect and holy God. Your greatest suffering was the sin that was at work in your life that separated you from that perfect and that holy God. Your greatest pain was the reality that you were not in a restored relationship with God Almighty. So my question to you is, in light of what your ultimate need is, what your ultimate suffering was, and what your ultimate pain is in this world, has God not responded by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for your sins? Has he not responded? You see, only in the Christian faith do we see in the character of God two aspects of God, transcendence and imminence. In every other religion, they go to one end of the spectrum or the other. Only in the Christian faith do we see a God who is both transcendent over his creation and imminent, meaning that he is involved actively within the lives of his creation and in the, the day in and day out of his creation. So Islam takes the position that God is transcendent. They would not reject the idea that God is transcendent. He is above his creation. So much so that the idea that God would take on flesh and come to this earth is absolutely abhorrent to them. That is blasphemous because that is God lowering himself to a level that God would never lower himself because he is transcendent over his creation. Now you take the opposite end of the spectrum and you take Buddhism, for example or you take the Wiccan religion, they would absolutely disregard the transcendence of God and they would only speak of the imminence of God, meaning that, that creation is God and God is creation. He's involved in all of that. God is the trees. God is the wind. That God is this kind of force that is working throughout uh, this uh, creation, that creation and God are one and the same. They would reject transcendence, but they would take an unhealthy view of imminence. Only in Christianity do you see a God who is sovereign above his creation, but yet is actively involved in the lives of each and every one of his creation. Only in Christianity do we see that. Only in the Bible do we see a God who is above all, but yet is actively involved in our lives. He's the one that has numbered every hair on our head, or for some of you, that used to be on your head. He remembers those. Think about this. You ever numbered the hairs that were on your head? You ever took time to do that? Again, some would be a shorter trip for others. I've never done that. God Almighty loves you so much that he knows minute details about you that you've never even taken time to stop and pause and consider. He cares about you that much and loves you that much. And so David explains to us that he's a God who responds. Second Peter 3, 9 tells us this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now, this text ultimately is talking about salvation, but I also think that we can read into this text and not stretch it to see that God is patient not just in areas of salvation, but that he has a perfect time for everything. And although we want to put God on our timetable and we want to put God on our clock, he knows exactly when it is that he should respond and exactly when it is he should do what it is that needs to be done, and he will do it. So God is a God who responds in his perfect timing. We see that David explains that he's exhorting them to trust in the Lord and turn to the Lord because the Lord rescues. 
Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Are you brokenhearted? Are you crushed in spirit? The Lord is near to you, and he will save you out of that. He rescues us. Remember that word, uh, deliver, is the idea of snatching out of, that he takes us out of that darkness. He takes us out of our sin. He brings us out of that. We see that we have a God who rescues. He doesn't just hear. He doesn't just know what's going on in his creation, but he actually steps into it. And when people cry out to him, he will step in and rescue them. Ultimately, we will see that in the glory and the kingdom that is to come. Colossians 1, 13 through 14, God's word tells us this. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. We see that when we call upon Christ Jesus, he rescues us from the domain of darkness. He takes us out of the domain of darkness and transfers us. He brings us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption. And that is what David will ultimately conclude with as he explains why we ought to trust the Lord and turn to the Lord because in verse 22 it says the Lord redeems the life of his servants none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned that he doesn't just rescue us and take us out of the darkness and say okay here you go now you figure it out from here on out no he not only rescues us but he redeems us in other words he transforms us he changes us he forgives us of our sins and he makes us a new creation So here we see the assurance that we have as followers of Jesus Christ, that our eternity is secured by the finished work of Christ Jesus, that the Lord redeems the life of his servants. Romans 8, 1 would say this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Conviction of the Holy Spirit, absolutely. Condemnation from God Almighty, never. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. In other words, the guilt has been removed, not by anything that we have done, but by everything that Jesus Christ has done. I love this psalm. I come back to it time and time again. But you know what makes this psalm so special? When it was that David wrote this. Fourteen times in the book of Psalms, a psalm is accredited to a specific event that transpired in the life of that psalmist. If you go back up to chapter 34, there should be a heading that tells you when this psalm was written and what event you can correlate what it is that he wrote this psalm to. My Bible says next to the 34th chapter of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. So let me provide a little bit of context as we come to uh, uh, the end of our time together. This psalm is so powerful because David had already been anointed king, was serving in Saul's uh, uh, court, and Saul became jealous of David and wanted to kill him. Jonathan found out to the degree that his dad wanted to kill David and so told him he needed to flee. And so David fled from Jerusalem and he actually went into enemy territory. And you can read about this in 1 Samuel 21. David flees Jerusalem, and he actually goes to Gath, the hometown of Goliath, the giant that he slayed. And he goes into enemy territory carrying the very sword that he used to cut off Goliath's head. Now, for whatever reason, he thinks this is a good idea, and he tries to blend in, but he's found out, and he's brought before the king. And he knows in that moment, I'm in trouble. I don't have anybody around me. I don't have anybody near me. I don't have anybody to protect me. And so in that moment, he takes upon himself this idea that he's going to act crazy. And so he starts drooling on himself, and he starts allowing spittle to come off of his beard, and he looks all kinds of crazy. And he starts etching his fingers and clawing at the doorpost of the gate of the city. And the king says, why in the world did you bring this man to me? Don't I have enough crazy people in my house already? Don't I have enough crazy people in my kingdom already? I don't need another lunatic. I don't need another crazy individual a part of my, uh, of my kingdom. And so he sent him away. And we read in chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, we read what happens next. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Agilom. 
And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. So he leaves, and he goes, and he's in this cave. And he's all by himself. Now think about that. He doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know what to do. Saul's after him, trying to kill him. He tried to go into enemy territory, but they, they, he can't stay there. So now he finds himself literally in a cave. You ever been there, figuratively speaking? You ever found yourself to where it feels like you're all alone in a cave? God is about to move in the most unexpected of ways, through the most unexpected of means. And as a result, David's going to write this psalm. You see, when David wrote this psalm, we read in verse 2 what it was that God did. In verse 2, everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became commander over them and there were with him about 400 men. God said that in your moment... Your cave of Agila moment, he's going to supply exactly what David needed in his perfect time to the perfect extent that he needed it. And he brought to him a whole army, a ragtag bunch of outcasts that had nowhere else to go, that were in complete distress, that were completely indebted, meaning that they could end up in debtor's prison. They had no hope, no way to get out of debt, and they were completely bitter in soul. But yet they came to David, and he became commander over them, and they became his army army and let me tell you something there is an empty tomb where there is a commander and a king named Jesus Christ and all those that are distressed all those that are indebted spiritually because of their sin all those that are bitter in soul can come to he will be the commander over your life you can be a part of his forgiven army and you can serve him all of the days of your life and experience goodness and so David says I'm going to exalt the Lord David says I exhort you taste and see that the Lord is good turn to him Trust in him because when I cried out to him, he brought y'all. When I cried out to him, he provided for me everything that I needed. And he delivered me from all my troubles and all of my fear. And so now I'm exhorting you to do the same thing. And guess what? I'm telling you, you'll experience the same thing because God is a God who responds. He's a God who rescues and he's a God who redeems. Amen. Man, that's good. I don't know if it's good for anybody else, but boy, that's good for my soul to hear that reality and that truth. Have you come to the cave? Not the cave of Agilom. Have you come to that empty tomb? And have you laid down all your burdens and all your sin at the feet of Christ? Is he your commander? Is he your king? Come and taste and see That the Lord is good. Maybe for the first time. Maybe for the millionth time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.